Hello there, welcome back to the booth here in Cleveland. We're here for Mythic Championship. Number one, that's Paul Chiano, Marshall Cycler. Thanks so much for coming along for Booster Draft. We got to watch Mike Segrist draft earlier this morning, and now we get to see him play. Out of the pod, which was actually quite a strong pod, if you went down the list of players, some really good ones, he's playing perhaps the best of the other players in the pod, Tiago Saparito, here in round number one. So nothing easy. <laughs> it's never easy out here at the Mythic Championship. And uh, Segrist is going to have to put what ended up being an Azorius control deck. He is very much towards the control end of things. I had a chance to look at his deck, and he's running all three Thought Collapse. Wow. All three Azorius. Uh, he's got a lot of card drawing in yeah, his deck, too. Yeah, so yeah. he's going to be drawing a lot of cards as well. Why don't we head on down? It's time for round one here from Mythic Championship, Cleveland. Hello and welcome back to coverage here of Mythic Championship 1 at Cleveland. I'm Marshall Cycliff. I'm with Paul Chion, and we are ready for round one action. We're watching Booster Draft here for Ravnica Allegiance. Down in the feature match area, you see we've got Mike Segrist on the left-hand side of your screen. Mike plays for Team Channel Fireball. He is a member of the Magic Pro League. Seating across from him, a tough customer as well. Tiago Saparito from Brazil plays for Team Haruri Latin. And uh, Tiago can battle. Yeah, I mean, he's been just one of the the best players from the South American region, or just the best players, period, over the last few years. And, uh, yeah, the, 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 I mean, going into this pod, if you just look at in terms of just the talent, I mean, you would say that these are probably the two best players in the pod. Yeah, I think so, too. And uh, this is going to be really fun to see how this actually plays out because <clears throat> as we watched, we had a chance to watch Mike Segrist do his actual draft. And when, when we were watching that, he... Uh, started off in Azorius and stayed in Azorius. And he has a very controlling Azorius deck. Uh, total power in this deck is not very high. It's like 16 or something like that. On the other side of the table, though, let's see what uh, Tiago's running. It looks like he's playing a Simic deck here. And, um, you know... It, look, Mike with a blistering start here with a two and a three drop, but yeah, combined power out. of two. Right, he's spent five mana. He's got Great. two power. It is evasive. <laughs> well, look at Tiago with uh, the chippy little attack here. Right. And that's a Biomancer's Familiar along with a Guild Mage there. Yeah, combined Guild Mage now from Tiago Saparito. So back-to-back -back gold cards here to kick things off for Tiago. And... Uh, well, the shields for Mike Sigrist are up for now. He does have seven toughness to go along with his two power. But, uh, boy, if you've ever seen Biomancer's Familiar do its thing, things get out of hand very quickly. And uh, that Guild Mage can also help pile on a bunch of extra counters and create a huge board here for Saparito. I do see, interestingly, he has in his hand a Plains. So it looks like he's got a Law Mage's Binding. I see. And it looks like Mike Sigrist is just firing off the Law Mage's Binding doesn't want the Combine Guild Mage um, to, to just kind of go off here. Because, you know, Tiago, if you look, he has access to a lot of different ways to kind of use his mana with the Familiar and the Guild Mage. He, he, you know, if, if the games go long, he can really just sink all of his mana into the various adapt creatures that he would have in his deck. Skatewing Spy is going to be the four mana play here for Saparito. So, boy, he's still looking pretty good. The Familiar there will help the Skate Wing Spy get tr well and truly out of hand and demand an answer from Sigrist that is going to have to be a removal spell or something like that, right? It, it, right. Th that's kind of what this does. You know, normally there's a dynamic where these blue-white decks can play these high-toughness blockers that kind of will blank a creature on the other side, right? right. Like if, if Tiago had a 3-3, you know, the Courier just says, well, I'm just going to sit here and block that indefinitely. But Simic especially if you have the familiar, that doesn't work. Those creatures, each creature that has an activated ability like Adapt will simply get too large. Right, yeah, all these creatures do is kind of stem the bleeding early, but if the games do go long, cards like the Skatewing Spy, or even just, you know, cards like Skidderia, all of that creatures are just eventually going to be attacking through 
these uh, these these creatures. An interesting situation here as well. So Saparito actually has the ability to adapt his skate wing spy thanks to the familiar, and he may want to do that because Sigris declined to activate the ability on his Senate courier and get in for just a chippy one point of damage. Instead, he's passed, which signals to Tiago that he could have some type of counter spell. And yep. in, the fact is, is that in this set, there are numerous counter spells that are that he's representing now, including absorb, <laughs> all the way up at rare. <laughs> More likely, thought collapse or quench are the cards that uh, Tiago Saparito is going to be playing around here. As it turns out, Sigrist actually is going to go just go ahead and go for the uh, Law Mage's binding. Oh wow! Okay, so not even On allowing, uh, not even giving Tiago the opportunity to spend the mana here. Wow, super interesting here. So, was that a Law Mage's binding, and then in response, Tiago activated the Biomancer's Familiar, and now the Skatewing Spy has a second, a third counter on it? Is that what happened? <laughs> so, Tiago must have ways to either deal with the Law Mage's binding or just have ways to move around counters. Or, or just had stone nothing else to do with his yeah, mana that, that is, turn? That just is very interesting. Because obviously, you know, generally speaking, you wouldn't want to dump mana into a creature that was being removed. Right. Even if it's technically not being removed from the board. So, yeah, if I was Mike, I would think either he had literally nothing else to do, or he has a way to get rid of Law Mage's Binding somewhere in his deck. Right. And But, but now, you know... Given that Tiago, it should have two counters. It does have two counters. Okay, yes. that's what I was thinking. Because it's simply Biomancer's familiar. So let's take a look at this card. Basically, Biomancer's familiar makes activated abilities cost two less, and then it allows you to adapt again on creatures with adapt. Because yeah. the ability of adapt says if a creature has a plus one plus one counter on it, you cannot adapt anymore. Right. But this kind of breaks that rule and right. allow you to kind of continue growing your adapt creatures. Yeah, and I think what happened is is that Tiago thought that it added an additional counter because he also tapped it even though it hadn't adapted yet, so that, that ability didn't actually do anything. Right. Now he wasn't going to attack with it anyway, so he didn't actually miss out on anything. Oh look at this. Tiago Saparito has one of the best rares in the format in his hand, but he's not going to play it out. You see that biogenic ooze that's oh sitting in Tiago's boy. hand, but he, he does smell some kind of counter magic here, yep. sniffs it out, and plays the worst threat here in the Windstorm Drake. Wow, and look at this. Lucky for Saparito, who already has five mana, plenty enough to work with, gets three lands milled off the top with that Thought Collapse. That's not a strategic element, but right. it's just good luck. And, and look at this, you know, Mike... They never have the second thought <laughs> collapse, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> who would play? Th who would play two of those? Yeah, or in this case, three, which right. is what he has. And again, now, now if I'm in Tiago's situation, it's like, okay, this is a little bit strange. He's got four mana up again. It probably has another counter spell. So again, playing around counter match by playing the worst threat here in Chillbringer, still a very, very strong creature. And then Mike, now Mike has to make a decision. I think Mike just says sure. Right. Because he has the Senate Courier in play, the Chillbringer is not really that big of a deal. No, and he has a really good alternate play. The Sphinx is inside to draw him some cards. He finds an island and another insight before drawing his card for the turn. So he did stumble a little bit on mana, but now he's back in the driver's seat as far as that goes. And Mike really trying to decide now, do I want to play out my Sphinx, or do I want to leave up both Sphinx's Insight and Thought Collapse? And he has wisely decided to leave those up. Now, will Tiago continue to play around a counterspell here? Yeah, well, at this point, though, right, Mike chose to play Sphinx's Foresight at instant speed instead of using the Addendum ability and gaining two life on turn. So this ring, this sends alarm bells for me. Yes. If I'm Tiago's, I am not playing that Biogenic Goose because Mike most likely has another counter spell here or some kind of instant speed spell. So you have to be really, really careful here. And if I'm in Tiago's situation, the Ooze is the absolute last threat that I want, that I want to deploy because if you're playing against an Azorius deck, like, it's just not sim simply not going to be able to deal with it unless it has a counter spell. But this just happened, by the way. So he went for Replicate, and that was enough to get Sigris to fire off the other copy that he had in his hand there of Thought Collapse. So now the shields are down for Sigrist, unless he can find one here. And now Tiago Saparito has definitely played himself to a position where he could resolve the ooze, which will completely take over this game. Right. You know, Sigris just doesn't have good answers for the ooze. Uh, if you put Law Mage's Binding on it, it does prevent it from creating more oozes, uh, but it does not stop it from growing the ooze that can attack, so that's still good value 
for uh, Tiago. And plus, when you look at it, Mike has already played two copies right. of Law Mage's Binding. You wouldn't expect him to have a third. He does actually have one in his deck. Right. But uh, in this case, things looking very good. And now Tiago just wants to play one more land so that he can play around Quench and just not get his, uh, his Biogenic Ooze quenched. Yeah, but he also has to think Mike likely doesn't have a Quench because the turn previously, Mike could have had Quench uh, for the Replicate. Mm -hmm. so, so now the coast is kind of clear. Well, and, and he, he could have had it for the... Uh, for the second card. Sorry, for, the, yeah, for yeah. the Creeper. Yeah, for the Creeper, for the Steeple Creeper. Right. But you're right. Yeah. You're totally right. He could have had it, and he would have played and it And when there. somebody plays Quench, you usually fire off Quench on anything. Basically anything <laughs> relevant. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. Especially when your opponent's already up to six mana, you're just like happy to get it out of your hand. So if that's the read that Tiago has, we may see him just go ahead and play out I the I think this here. is the time to play the Ooze. Yeah, especially given that uh, here it is. his opponent has... Oh, there it is. Ooze goes on the stack. A great read. Wow, Saparito has been playing beautifully this game working his way around all of this. And Sigrist is in huge trouble now. Biogenic Ooze is on the short list of best cards in the set. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And now it's five mana. You get a 2-2, end of turn. You put a plus one, plus one counter on each Ooze you control. And then it has that activated ability that you see that, you know, if left unchecked, you don't, once Ooze is in play, you don't need to play any other spells for the rest of the game. If they cannot deal with the Ooze, you're just going to win That's right. with, with, and, with the Ooze. And what we have now is a straight-up race situation. Like, Sigrist has to now attack with as many things as he reasonably can. It's really awkward because he's so close to a two-turn clock here. Right. He can hit for six in the air. Uh, and then the problem, of course, becomes twofold. One, it's not a two-turn clock because Tiago's at 13, not 12. But the other problem is the Steeple Creeper and the, uh, the Chillbringer are just going to sit here and block effectively. So this is a really tough spot now. Also, the Oozes have fly. Right. Because of the <laughs> Skatewing Spy on the battlefield, any creature with a plus one, plus one counter on it has flying. Yeah, Mike's So there's just almost no way Mike can actually just come back from no, this. No, we're kind of in sweeper land here, and right. he doesn't have one. Yeah. I, I got to say, I'm really impressed by how Tiago's played this. Oh yeah, absolutely. He's he's played this beautifully. He he is he's aware of the fact that the blue white deck has access to those counters. The Sphinx's foresight that Mike Segrist fired off at instant speed also told Tiago that it's very likely that Mike is holding some kind of counter spell in hand, and he played around it. He played around the two counter spells, and then once Mike finally ran out of counters and tapped out to basically play the Sphinx of Foresight, that's when he you know pulled the trigger on the Biogenic Ooze. Yeah, I, this has been a totally good draw by Sigrist. You know, n no complaints from him, but uh, Tiago Saparito has just played beautifully in this game and set himself up to take this thing down. If he has another land, he can also create another ooze token, right. but it doesn't look like he'll need it in this particular game. So he's going to attack with three of his <coughs> five available attackers. Segris is going to double block the Steeple Creeper, which is just going to be a trade, but still quite a bit of damage. Six hitting Segris, and uh, and things aren't getting better for him here either. Oh, actually, he doesn't need a land. You're right because of the Biomancer. I forgot. Yeah, that's my fault. <laughs> but uh, he he actually has the the just triple green to pay for it, and uh, turns out not super relevant anyway. As Segris packs up his cards, and that is game number one going to Tiago. Saparito, his deck looks very good, and boy, if he keeps playing this well, I really like his chances in this matchup. Yeah, and a lot of his cards line up really well with the types of removal that Mike has. He's got cards like Sky Tether and Slimebind, but Tiago just has a lot of great mana sinks in his deck, and he doesn't really care if some of his threats just get Sky Tether because they're still relevant at, uh, at uh, many points in the game. That's right. Well, our players are going to start taking a look at their sideboards here. And we're going to uh, take a short break. When we come back, though, we'll have more action from the feature match area here at Mythic Championship Cleveland. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back to the feature match area here at Mythic Championship Cleveland. Marshall Sucliffe in the booth with Paul Chion. And we're back down in the feature match area here taking a look at what's going on kind of around the tables here, but we are focused, of course, on our main table, which is Mike Segrist, Siggy, as he is known. MPL player. Yep. Been doing the MPL streaming thing quite a bit and really enjoying it. And kind of duking it out in terms of uh, how high he can get up into the mythic ranks on Arena in yep. Limited. Mm -hmm. I know he was battling Marcio Carvalho in yep. the first season to see who would hit Mythic 1. Yep. And I believe at various points they were both Mythic 1. Mm -hmm. Fighting it out back right. and forth. Yep. I mean, he is kind of known as a Limited Master. Of course, he's great at all facets of Magic, but I mean, when it comes to just... Um, his role on his playtesting team, he is kind of looked to as the limited mastermind. And, you know, in the limited meetings, oftentimes people will look to Mike Sigrist as a person who kind of like, hey, what do you think about this card? Tell us, because, you know, we're not sure. And he often will be one of the best people at kind of evaluating the power level of a lot of these cards. That's Thiago Saparito on the other side. Belovo is his online name. Yeah, and taking a look at... Tiago Saparito's deck, it Boy. looks fantastic. Yeah. It looks like he was the only Simic drafter. Right, because that looked like a really good draw, but right. I, I think we can expect that. Like, right. That's the, the level of cards in his deck. It's like all gold cards. Yeah, I, I was taking a look. I'm like, maybe it was just a good draw, and I'm looking, and he's got triple Aramunculus, <laughs> double Combine Guildmate. He just has all the Simic cards. Yeah. Double Gatebreaker Ram with, uh, with a bunch of Guild Gates in his deck as well. So just lots and lots of power, along with, of course, that Biogenic Ooze that we saw take over that game. Yeah, I think this is actually going to be quite difficult for Sigrist. Uh, generally speaking, Siggy has a very strong control deck in his hands here, but some of the things don't line up perfectly well right. against what Tiago's doing. Yeah, I mean, Simic specifically just has so many monsters that are just going to be able to crash through those Senate, uh, the Senate Couriers. Yeah. Oh, so I don't think you were able to see it there, no. but <laughs> yeah. So explain what just happened because Mike, that was pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah, Mike has a Sphinx of Foresight in his opening hand, yes, so he, he does. does get to yes, scry three uh, before the game starts here, which is extremely powerful. Yeah. Now he gets to set up his draws, curve out perfectly, find the right ratio of lands and spells, <laughs> and of course probably play a Sphinx of Foresight on curve here. Yeah, it's not good news for Tiago Saparito, and I, I think we caught it on camera. He kind of gave it, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, kind of a look there. <laughs> do what you got to do. Yep. But yeah, the Scry 3 is, is already powerful enough, but as you said, you know, Foresight indeed, right? right? It gives your opponent a little glimpse of what they may be facing coming up down the line. Although yep. it does look like Seacrest uh, went top, bottom, bottom, and is now out of lands and doesn't have a mm, second blue wow. source. <laughs> wow, that is incredible. He had yeah. he even got to do got to got to scry three, but uh, yeah. So he's going to have to settle for sky tether on Aramunculus just to uh, bring that thing down to the ground and give it defender. So he's not going to be taking any damage from that and buy himself a little bit of time. But boy, if I'm Tiago, I'm feeling very good here. He's just going to pass a turn though after playing his fourth. Uh, land. Oh no, another double blue Jeez. spell off the top. If Sigrus can find any land at this point, he's going to be in good shape. He has two copies of Sphinx's Insight and that'll give him the ability to power through the rest of his deck. But there's Biogenic oh Ooze on turn five with no quench. Mike Segrist has to say, sure, you got it. And this is uh, about done. Yeah, th this is this is just going to be over. I mean, yeah. uh, Mike Segrist needed a second island to even represent a thought collapse, which might have slowed down Tiago. Yes. But given that he only had two planes and an island up, he can't even represent that card. Uh, we're just done here. He's going to play a, a Sphinx's Insight. Sure, he has to go through the motions, but he just doesn't have proper answers to the ooze, especially now that Tiago gets to guaranteed make another ooze token. Even if Mike finds a Law Mage's Binding and casts it next turn, he's going to be facing, you know, a four and a three, and then a five and a four, and it's just going to end. I, I wonder if Tiago at this point is so far ahead that he might consider playing around Summary Judgment, but it I, looks like I he's would. not going to. Yeah, I would have think just attack with the Ooze token there, because over time, your right. Ooze is actually outgrow the maximum damage from a, from a Summary Judgment anyway. Right. But he's just in, in comes the team, and Segrist actually needs that immediately. He only has one copy of Summary Judgment in his deck, but if he has it, he can kill the Ooze, and there are, he does have it. Look okay. at this. So 
Tiago decided not to play around it. Oh, oh, he didn't need to. Wait, no, that's that. It does five damage, doesn't it? Well, it's untapped now. Oh, it's untapped. Of course, yeah. of course, of course. Right, 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's going to do it. In fact, going to prompt a concession from Mike Segrist. So that, uh, that ooze just crushing it and bringing the game home there for Tiago Saparito. And uh, wow. Uh, one of the best cards in the set, as we mentioned, and now you know why. <laughs> <laughs> that card is yeah, ridiculous. That card is no joke. Yes, yeah, completely crazy. We're going to go back uh, to our other feature drafter now, Tom Ross, friend and co-worker of yours uh, at right. one point. Uh, he's playing against Francisco Sanchez from England, plays for Team Spanish Masters. Tom, currently not on uh, an official team. Of course, he does test with, with people, but... Um, Let's see how they're doing as we pop into this one. Because Tom, we got to watch draft, and he opened perhaps the best card in the set, Ethereal Absolution. It's on the short list. And really stuck to his guns. I mean, right. he was not leaving Orzov for anything. No Rakdos cards could come that would change right. his mind. There was nothing. But it kind of came together in pack two and then fell apart a little bit in pack three. How did the deck end up? Uh, I, I think, Tom, as you can already see, uh, Mediocrity playing, is what I see. Playing some, some filler cards. Um, Night just, of Sorrows indeed. Right. <laughs> just so he could play that Ethereal Absolution. And, and I think, you know, just based on how the draft went, I think had he looked to instead be a little more open to read signals, he would have ended up with a Rakdos deck, most likely splashing for the Ethereal Absolution, and his deck would be much, much stronger. But Tom really stuck to his guns, tried to cut Orzov as hard as he could, got rewarded in pack two with a ton of great cards, but again, in pack three, the person passing to him was very likely in Orzov and got almost nothing in the last pack. So he actually has kind of, you know, again, he has to play a few subpar cards, but at the same time, he does have one of the most powerful rares in the format in Ethereal Absolution. Yeah. I think it might just be the best rare in the set. Yeah, it's so easily it? on that top three list and maybe number one. Interestingly, by the way, Francisco, A, okay, so he's in Rakdos. So he will not have answers for Ethereal Absolution if it hits the battlefield. That's just not what that color pair is about. But also, it looks like he was the one that benefited from the fact that Tom decided not to go in. He, yeah. Because he's the one that ended up in Rakdos. And you see the Rakdos Firewheeler here on his side of the battlefield. Yeah, I, I, I was wondering, whoever the Rakdos player is going to be is going to have him. an extremely powerful deck. We saw a ton of just get the points, multiple Firewheelers, even a very, very late uh, Cult Guild Mage going around as well. And I think a lot of those cards ended up in Francisco's deck. <laughs> there, oh, look at this. He's got get the point for the Basilica Bell Haunt. But the damage was done from that. Life right. gain, discard, and it took away his premium removal spell. He's going to be fine with that. Yeah, and there's one Ooh, pretty amazing it. thing that I see in Francisco's deck. Well, what does he have? I saw, I saw better than the Fire Wheeler? Well, well, I don't know if it's better, but I mean, this is just <laughs> ridiculous. Okay. I see Priest of Forgotten Gods, which is a pretty cool card yeah. to have, right? Yeah. He's got three of them in his deck. What? How is that even possible? That's a rare. <laughs> that's and I didn't incredible. even see any in the draft. Yeah, he must have taken them very early. Wow, that's interesting. Although, I have to say, looking at the board right now, he doesn't <laughs> seem very well set up for it. No, no, no. <laughs> He's got one creature. But whatever, maybe he'll, uh, wow, a wait a minute. A <laughs> what if he sacrificed two Priest of the Forgotten Gods to his other Priest of the Forgotten Gods? Uh, I mean, that's that, possible. That is an incredible story right. if he can do that. <laughs> yeah, but Priest certainly a card that's uh, a little more equipped for the Orzov deck where you have after, uh, access to more of those afterlife cards. Boy, I got to say, though, Tom Ross down to seven life and taking some damage, but he's got Consume in his hand, and that'll mm -hmm. do a very nice job of taking care of that Firewheeler next turn. Yeah, but... But look at Francisco's hand still, just Ooh, full of just premium cards. He's got that get the point, too. And the discard from the Basilica Belha might not matter because he's got a Rixmati Reveler mm -hmm. in hand as well. And given that there's that ill-gotten inheritance on the battlefield, he doesn't even need to get in an actual attack in with that Fire Wheeler. He just needs to get that, that one trigger from the ill-gotten inheritance and then fire off that R Rixmati Reveler. So I think there's yeah. a really good chance here that Francisco fires off that get the point here, end of turn. Yeah, and then, that's what he was thinking about. Yeah, and then refill his hand with that Reveler. Yeah, because he was actually considering multiple things there. One... Do I want to try to empty my hand? And if so, what am I gonna? What am I willing to fire off? Get the point on if I have to discard it anyway. Two, should I play my land? Right. Because if he didn't play his land and say there was another Basilic Bell Haunt or something like that, it could really 
mess up his plan. He'd have to discard either a premium removal spell or his reload spell. So he decided to keep it in his hand. Although, yeah, it's interesting that he used the get the point on the... Uh, the veteran there? The, the veteran there instead of the Knight of Sorrows. Because if he used it on the Knight of Sorrows, then if he has the option to trade... And look at this. Smart play wow. by Francisco. There was that Basilica Bell Hunt coming back from Dead Rebels. Wow. Re seriously, he thought about that for a long time. That right. was really smart. It did not play out that land. Yeah, and now he's going to be rewarded for it because he's going to draw a card and hopefully he can get it out of his hand. And if he can get in, <coughs> he's going to be able to draw three cards. The Ilgon Inheritance guarantees spectacle, so that part he doesn't have to worry about. What did he draw? That's the question. Because the only awkward part is if he can't actually deploy both cards and he just have to discard a spell. It's a little, it's a little bit annoying. But if it's just a land, and that's what it was, then he could just pay the four mana for the Reveler here, and he's going to draw three cards. A huge is that, is that good? Four mana, two, two, draw three cards? <laughs> that's pretty good. Now, he's only got two mana left over and a land drop already used, so he does have to find a one or two mana spell if he wants to start deploying stuff now. Yeah, I wonder if Francisco is now willing to trade this Fire Wheeler yeah. for the Bell Haunt here. I think Tom, you are. He is winning the race here. Tom Ross is at nine. And he does have that inheritance on the battlefield as well. So this would threaten lethal. Yeah, I like, I like this attack here from Francisco. Because look at this. He's going to follow up with another small creature. And the 3-4 Basilica Bell Hunt is really annoying to try to get through on the ground. So getting a trade there, sure, it was time. Yeah, Francisco's deck looks great. It I mean, really look does. At all these cards. And Just I think he has Tom Ross to thank for it. I right. mean, a lot of these flowed through Tom. Yeah, absolutely. Pack three, you just, I'm sure anybody who was following the dress like, oh, no, not this one. Oh, not this one. Not yeah. again, not again. I mean, yeah. there were just, the Rakdos cards were just just flowing pack three. I mean, there, 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 it seems like there's one, maybe two Rakdos drafters, but like certainly it was kind of one of the open guilds. Even, even when it, you, uh, I was looking at Mike Seeger's seat, it is possible that Rakdos was a color combination he could have been in. Still, Ross did put together a nice deck, and he was rewarded for his dedication to Orzov in the first pack by that second pack. One of the cards he got is that Consecrate Consume. You also see Grotesque Demise, which he could use right now to take care of one of the threats on the other side of the battlefield. The Trumpeter being the, the more important one, he would need to do that now because he could risk putting himself in an awkward position if Francisco uh, draws another land. <coughs> yeah, Tom, Tom does need to put together some pressure and deal with the board here because of that Ilgant Inheritance, which is a card that's really overperformed. I think kind of going into the limited format, a lot of people are like, oh, this is kind of slow. You're tapping out. doesn't affect the board. But, you know, I've seen a lot of people play it, and it's really done a lot of work. Tom, though, in a little bit of an awkward position, he can cast two spells this turn. But he has to really decide exactly how he wants to approach this next turn, what he predicts Francisco will actually do. He's going to play the veteran. He had gotten that back with the Dead Rebels the turn prior, so that was a known card to Francisco. And the question is now, does he want to play Consume or leave up Grotestimize? Mm -hmm. The safer play is to play Consume, but it's only nabbing a Rixmati Reveler, which at this point is just a 2-2. It's not a card you particularly care about. Right. Ooh, look at this. He's going to go for Dead Revels, though in this case, he's only got one target. So that was another thing that he was really considering. But you saw that attack from the Knight of Sorrows, and it said to him, even though he's behind in the damage race, he said, I have ways I can win this damage race. And buying back the Basilica Bell Hunt certainly plays into that game plan. Along with, of course, the Consume. So he just has multiple ways to gain life, which should help him race the Ill-Gotten Inheritance, but still needs to be careful here because the Ill-Gotten Inheritance, of course, has the six mana sacrifice outlet that allows Francisco to drain Tom for four, uh, for four life. Yeah, so this card, I mean, you're mostly playing it for the consume. Yes. You're pretty sad to be consecrating. Only but, desperate. But, but <laughs> right. But the consume effect by itself is an extremely powerful card yeah. in Limited. Yeah, normally, you know, we call these edicts. Oh, and look at this. He's going to go for it. On the second activation, wow. though, Tom Ross finds the opening for the Grotestimize. 
beautiful setup there, and it actually worked. Francisco just went all in and was maximum punished there by Tom. Yeah, that, that was that was huge, that huge was tempo swing. Yeah, Francisco Tap just going for the win there. Lands, yes. Yeah. Wow, incredible. That was probably the game, right? right. I mean, that was a, a game losing sequence there, as Tom Ross now gets to play the Bell Hunt, buffer his life total further. Jeez. <laughs> get in for some damage. Well, look at all the life. T Tom Ross just with the black-white life gain strategy here. Carry an imp as well, exiling a creature, gaining life. That's right. He did, although, uh, remember, he did attack with the two creatures in the middle as well. One has vigilance and one untaps another creature. So even though they're not tapped, they actually did get in for five. And Tom Ross, boy, you could see why he was taking so long to decide that turn sequence. And it worked out beautifully for him. Although this is nice. There's Carnage now from uh, Francisco, which is going to get that consume out of hand. The problem is, is that the shields are pretty well down here Francis for Francisco, and he's behind on board now significantly. Yeah. Yeah, Francisco doesn't have the best blocks here. Rakdos really good at attacking, not so much on defense. No, and this is a fine attack force here for Tom Ross. This is a lethal attack. He's attacking for 10, so he's forcing Francisco to block something. And once again, visually it doesn't look like it, but all creatures are attacking here. Right. And so the Rick's Mahdi Reveler doesn't have a great block here. It can't effectively trade with any of the creatures that Tom Ross is attacking with. Francisco can choose to block with the Roustabout and trade with a creature. Oh, but he's going for the double block here yep. on the Basilica Bell Hunt. This is going to put him down to just two life. But let's not forget ill-gotten inheritance. That'll put him back up to three and Tom down to eight. Tick tock, and there's a four mana, or I should say an eight damage life swing ability as well. Do four to you, I gain four, and it looks like he's gonna have to take this turn to activate that ability on the ill-gotten inheritance. That would put him back up to seven with the Reveler as a block. He could survive yet one more turn. Yeah, I so don't know how he wins from this point though. He's just so I, I, far behind on board. Right. It would involve having to sacrifice the inheritance this turn and somehow finding a way to get in for four points of damage. Yeah, it's really tough. The Reveler was great in its, uh, you know, triggered ability when it entered the battlefield, but on board it's just a 2-2. Two -two. Oh, you know what? I don't know if he has one in his deck, but if Francisco has a skewer the critics, that there would get it done. So if he doesn't sacrifice the ill-gotten inheritance, oh, no, but he has to, he, he must. right, to, yeah. to survive. That's the problem. He would need multiples of skewer. So this one still looks very much in Tom the Boss Ross's hands. It's going to take a sequence of cards here from Sanchez to be able to come back and actually survive as he's in chump block mode and still falling down to critically low life total. He does have Scorch Mark to finish off the Night of Sorrows, though <clears throat> Tom Ross looks at it and says, do I actually want to cast this uh, final payment? And the answer is no. no. The only thing you would get is the 1-1 is the one, one flyer. Is that actually relevant? You'd have to target something, right? Right. He would have to use the final payment to kill one of his other creatures, which I don't think he wants to do. Right. You need to have a creature to target with the final payment. I think he's, I think he's like, can I target my own creature oh, and that you sacrifice, sacrifice itself? Like, he's reading it. Can you do that? I've never I seen that not, happen, I've actually. I haven't done it before. I'm not actually sure. Yeah, he oh, did. It looks like you can. Okay. He did it. He's the boss. There's a reason. <laughs> That's kind of cool. And he does maintain that board presence where now he any two creatures that get in are lethal. A top deck from Francisco Sanchez says, no, it's not enough. And Tom Ross finds his way through that game. Boy, I keep going back to that one turn where Tom really tanked it out. And he left himself the opportunity to use that grotesque demise. The way it plant, you know, the way that it plays out. Uh, with the Trumpeter is you can target it now. If they pump it once, you can still target it. But if they have the additional ability to pump it again but don't, your, your hands are tied. Because yeah. if you target it, then they pump. And if you don't, then they go, okay, take the damage. And it's really tricky to find out, you know, is your opponent really going to go for it? Because if you think that they are, then you can take this risky but extremely high upside line, which is exactly what Tom did there, and boy, did it pay off for him. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And you really got to see Tom take full... I mean, the Basilica Bell Hunt did so much work in that. He cast it three times. You cast Basilica Bell Hunt three times in any matchup, That's you're the probably going to win that game. Probably so. Yeah. Especially against aggressive decks. Right. That's where it actually shines the best. Right. Like, imagine that against what we saw from Seagrist earlier. 
fine, that would be really good. Right. But that would not get in for any damage. The life, to the life gain is not super relevant. And Mike has so many cards, he could actually still function pretty well. But, I mean, you gain nine life against the aggro deck. Oh, yeah. Pretty good. Also against Mike Seagrass deck specifically, the Bell Hunt would never die. Yeah. <laughs> it would never actually <laughs> That's a great here. point. <laughs> Block with my courier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that happens. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think that uh, Tom would have to sacrifice it to final payment right, to get right, it in the exactly. yard. Right, Because uh, Mike's not doing it. I'm still wondering if this is a typo. The three priests are forgotten gods. That's really interesting. I mean, he wrote it down there yeah, in yeah, ink yeah. pen. <laughs> right, right. Let's just say I hope it's not a typo for his sake. Because I also just want to see it get well. activated. Me too, but we haven't yeah. even seen one. I feel right. robbed. Yeah. I liked uh, Sanchez's line there, uh, the turn prior, by the way. I thought he really did navigate that situation well, also while, while trying to, to decide whether he should uh, play a more patient game or try to maximize the Rixmati Reveler, and he decided to maximize the Reveler. And while his draws from that weren't fantastic, I think that was the right line. Right. I, I think the, the, obvious, the, the turning point there was the decision to pump the Trumpeter the second time. Yes. Because... It's kind of it's one of those situations where like you you know you, you look to see who flinches first right yep. it's like okay I pumped it once and Tom's like sure. he could have certainly cast a demise there in response to the first pump but he's like if he does it again though this is a huge blowout and he did and Sanchez could have certainly just pumped once once that resolved he goes okay if he has a demise here yeah go you to know, damage I, I'm just gonna get him the three points of damage there and then he had the option to play a roust about that turn but he went for the kill there, and I mean, that, that, that cost him there. Yep. He was trying to set up the two-turn sequence where he could get in for a bunch and then untap and sacrifice his ill-gotten inheritance, but that did not end up being the line that paid off. And I have to say, especially after having seen that the rest of that game play out, I really like Tom's game plan here, especially right. uh, in games two and three, a lot better. Uh, the Dead Revels times two is really... I mean, when your opponent's like, I have get the point. Mm -hmm. Right, I, this is my premium removal spell, and you're like, yeah, sure, you know, and just buy your good creatures back and just keep recasting them, and specifically cards that gain life are going to be so important here. And also, like, I just want to say, all of that happened with no ethereal absolution in sight. Right. Like, if that ever happens, it's like, oh, never mind. You know, the <laughs> yeah, game's th over. Yeah, th that's one of those like free win cards, right? Right. I mean, you kind of saw that with Tiago Saparito in his Biogenicus. I mean, you, you just play one of these cards, and if your opponents can't answer it, you're just going to run away with the game. Tom's going to take a mulligan here. He didn't see the Ethereal Absolute, so he just shipped it back. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'm kidding. He right. uh, looked at a hand that had one land and, and sent that back. Curious to see if Francisco's got a keeper here or no. Now keep in mind, Tom cannot use the, uh, the London mulligan here. Right, we're not <laughs> in London yet. We're not quite there yet, are we, Paul? That's generated a lot of interesting discussion mm -hmm. in the Magic community. Um, and I, have you considered combo decks? Have you? Did you? <laughs> no, of course not. No, you didn't. No, I knew no. it. See, I thought I was right. going to be the one to. <laughs> yeah. The intention, of course, with this mulligan, which we have now tested a, a good amount mm -hmm. within, within the play design team, is just to give, just to make for the absolute best limited and standard experience. And so far, we, I mean, I have absolutely loved this mulligan in terms of just the gameplay. Ooh, and, that, that makes me excited. And so, uh, you know, I'm hoping that once people get to see it in action, they get to appreciate it as well. So, <laughs> first time for everything, Paul. This is my first time in the format with Scrabbling Claws on the <laughs> battlefield. So Tom Ross shows up and just breaks it. This is one, okay, there it is on your screen there. Yeah, but Tom missed his second land drop here. Yeah, but he's got Scrabbling Claws. So. Oh, and, and Francisco's playing a Rick's Mighty Reveler, so now Tom has a target for the Scrabbling Claws because you cannot actually sack the claws. Hilarious. Unless, you don't have, uh, unless there's a target. You're so right. This might get Tom back into it, actually. Oh, Francisco's going to say, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Right. I mean, perhaps it still would be correct. And look at it. Here's land number two and an impassioned mm. order from Tom Ross. What in the world is Scrabbling Claws doing in the deck? I'm going to say that, okay, either Tom was light on playables because, you know, we, we did see that it was kind of weak in pack three. But uh, on top of that, uh, Tom, Tom may have seen a card like a Dead Revels, and Scrabbling Claws might be a way to kind of interact with stuff like Dead Revels. And also, it cycles, kind of. Ish. And which gets him closer to, of course, the best card in his deck, which is uh, Ethereal Absolution. 
Wow. So Tom Ross going very deep here. I get, I've get. i played this format a lot. Mm -hmm. I have never seen that card on the battlefield. Yeah. It yeah. is not great. <laughs> right. And Francisco does have a dead revel, so he must have seen the game one. Okay, there you go. And uh, decided to bring it in. I just thought it was a, a low enough cost. He's going to go ahead and pump up his trumpeter as well as uh, Francisco. Looks like he doesn't have a lot to do. Look, that pump ability strong. That is not what you want to be doing on this turn, oh, no. ideally. Very aggressive play here from Francisco. Whether it's chosen or not, I don't know. But let's see what he's got going on here. He's going to play a Carrion Imp, and thanks to that Rixmati Reveler being in the graveyard, he's actually going to get to gain the two life and work towards stabilizing this board state. So right now, Francisco really would prefer to have a removal spell or something. Get the point, maybe? Yeah, that would be great. And there it is. Get the point to kill the Imp. And that's going to allow him to scry one and then attack for three damage and keep this assault going because he is really trying to pounce while Tom is stumbling on mana. The good news for Tom Ross is that he is really drawn out of those mana issues with the help of, of all things Scrabble and Claws and then just top <laughs> of his library. He does draw another land this turn as well. Let's see what he's working with. Uh, that, is, that is a pretty excellent hand for Tom Ross. He does have the Forbidding Spirit that he could play. I believe he also drew the planes this turn. So he can play the Spirit to kind of slow down the offenses for one turn. And then he has the Dead Revel. So he's happy, you know, trading block. or blocking or Snap doing whatever off, right, yeah. to, to get that Dead Revels back. Or to get the creatures back with Dead Revels. What is this? Is that captive audience? Oh, wow. Wow, turn seven. He did not miss a land drop this entire oh, I'm game. I'm so excited for this. By and the way, Tom has an answer in his hand. Oh, no. Does Tom he has have final, final payment? Oh, my God. Cap Tom has <laughs> final payment in his hand. Captive audience is Re under his control. He owns the captive audience. What's really funny is oh. I, uh, uh, a member of the coverage team, Rashad, was telling me this exact story. His opponent played... This enchantment captive and audience. captive audience, and, and he had final <laughs> payment to sacrifice it to kill one of his opponent's creatures. And Tom opting to go to four, but now he can use his final payment to sacrifice. Unbelievable. To <laughs> this is so mean. Look at Tom reading captive audience. He's like, wait, 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 wait. You can wait. sack an enchantment. Look at him. Look at Tom. <laughs> I'm not sure. Does Tom see it, though? I would say yes. yes. I mean, Tom is one of those really creative, you know, sees the game from a lot of different angles type players. He's not an in-the-box thinker when right, it comes right, right. to magic, and I would, I would expect him to see it, even, it, even though that's an extremely strange interaction on a mythic rare as well. Absolutely. A card but you just don't see often. Keep in mind, though, Tom can actually use this at end of... At, during Francisco's turn because final payment yes. is an instant. So he can just pass because... The captive audience's trigger happens on Tom Ross's upkeep. On his own upkeep, right. right. This is incredible, though. This was supposed to be the, the way that Francisco wins. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, it did force Tom's hand in that he didn't have an option, right? He can't let Francisco have the five zombies. <gasps> oh, he no, doesn't, he, he doesn't, doesn't see it, see it Paul. He didn't see it. He did not figure it out. And oh, so no. he's going to sacrifice the Footlight Fiend. And this is probably going to cost him the game because the next trigger is either his whole hand going away or Francisco getting five, five zombies. zombies. He's going to give him the zombies, right? Because of he got all those creatures back. Oh, no. Oh. He didn't see it. It's oh. such a weird niche interaction. It right. happens almost never. Wait, wait. Those effects, final payment -like type effects, almost always say sacrifice a creature. Exactly. And part of the reason why it says sacrifice is an enchantment is to make the card white. Because either because uh, otherwise that would be a primarily black effect. Yep. So we added sacrifice and enchantment onto that card to make it a white card. But it's not something that we expect it to happen very often. Down to three for Tom Ross thanks to the dagger caster. Go and here's that trigger on upkeep and this is likely going to seal the deal for Francisco Sanchez because as you mentioned Tom just got back a bunch of creatures. He's not going to discard his hand. But five zombies, he can't answer that. He doesn't have Kai's Wrath in his deck. Right, there's, there's just no way. And keep in mind, that's five zombies and a trumpeter that, could, that, that has menace that can also deal three points of damage here. Yeah. And Tom is in desperation mode, and even his best card can't get him out of it at this point. Right. 
I wanted to see that on camera oh, so I bad, Paul. Too. I'm not going to lie. Doesn't happen very often. You know, but it's I really, so I can't blame Tom. That it, it, it is such a crazy, narrow interaction. I mean, the, the number of things that have to happen for this to actually come to fruition <laughs> is so rare because captive audience is a mythic. It doesn't go particularly well in a normal Rakdos deck. Right? It's not like every rack does, oh right. yeah, I'll just windmill slam it. Many of them just don't even play it. Also, how often are you sacrificing enchantments to kill things? Yes, it's so right? rare. I, I feel like a genius when I sack my own enchant. Like, <laughs> and, and this is not one that somebody gifted to me. Right, you know. exactly. Oh, incredible stuff. And Francisco Sanchez, I wonder if he's seen it. Like when Paul said sacrifice my footlight fiend, or excuse me, when Tom said sacrifice my footlight fiend, I wonder if Francisco was like, Oh my god, <laughs> I just dodged this the is big a lethal bullet. attack, right? This is easily lethal. Yeah, he's yep. got a hasty Gore Clan wrecker as well as everything else. And that's the hand being extended. Francisco and look, he's he did see no. it. He oh, did know. No. And I, I I'm sure Tom will appreciate the tip, but boy, that's gotta be insult to injury right, right. after you lose mm -hmm. to have your opponent go. And by the way, you could have won. Yeah. I mean, Francisco is helping Tom here because maybe it happens again, but yep. it still feels very bad because you've just lost the first round of the, pro, uh, yeah. Of the Mythic Championship. Yeah, but honestly, you know, I, I, I'm, my mentality is you got to be forget like this. That is such a crazy like, you have to have played this format so much to have seen that happen mm -hmm. or to have it. I mean, you know, for me, one of the ones I was telling my friend a story about something that happened to me, which is that I needed to find a removal spell. I absolutely had to have it. And what I did is I drew my card for the turn, and it was Dovin's Acuity. And I'm like, well, that's not a removal spell, but I'll play it. I have no board state, but my opponent only has one creature. I play Dovin's Acuity, and I draw final payment, and I'm like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I can sacrifice it to my own final payment. Like, oh, it was right. literally runner, runner yeah, yeah. to get the job done. But, you know, that isn't the type of thing, again, that even occurred to me immediately. It took me a second to go, right. oh, I actually can do, you know, I got extraordinarily and, lucky and, there. But. And part of the reason why we thought Tom might have seen that line is because he had a very creative play with final payment the, the game before mm -hmm. where he t targeted the creature and sacrificed that creature. He did something with sequence. final payment I've never seen done. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I thought, oh, this is just automatic. Yeah, but uh, again, of, yeah. not the most intuitive thing. Yeah. Sacrificing an enchantment on final payment to remove something, but uh, yeah. but wow. So what a great finish, though. An exciting uh, way to round the, uh, excuse me, to end <laughs> the first round here for the Mythic Championship in Cleveland. We're going to take a short commercial break. When we come back, though, we'll have Rich and Maria at the news desk.
Hello everyone, welcome back to the news desk. Rich Hagen here, and uh, we are gearing up for round number two. There's only one match out left on the floor. They had a little bit of a time extension, so they are heading into the five additional turns to determine the outcome. Uh, now, our featured drafter, we're following him all morning, is Mike Sigrist. Of course, he's a member of the Magic Pro League, the MPL. He is waiting on the floor, and so is Brian David Marshall. I'm here on the floor with Magic Pro League member Mike Sigrist. Mike, i got to ask you, how about that biogenic ooze? <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one to beat. I, uh, I actually joked with Thiago before the match started. There was a stack of tokens there, and you know, a pile of oozes, and I was like, oh, I'm going to need those, you know, tr trolling him that I you know, had it in my deck. And he's like, I need, I need those. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was a tough matchup. Uh, the, the, his deck lined up very well against mine. Now, you're, you're, we watched you draft this, this deck. How, how did you feel as you were uh, going through the packs, and you know, how, how did how did you feel it went for you? What did, what did you think you ended up with in terms of like a grade on this deck? Uh, I would give this deck a B minus, I guess. Um, I think I think I found the open lane. I was pretty happy with how I drafted. I wish the packs broke a little better for me in terms of win conditions because my deck's a little light on those. Uh, but other than that, I, I, I like my archetype, and I you know think I have a good chance to win the next two. Put, put a lot of burden on a Concordia Pegasus there, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I have, like, two or three real real win conditions, and so i got to make sure that they go the whole way. Let me, let me ask you a question. For people who, you know, are not draft masters like yourself, uh, when you talk about finding your lane, uh, uh, you know, what, what does that mean when you're sitting down at a table full of people who've qualified for the Mythic Championship, who've been there before, like Tiago, Tom Ross? Like, what, what, is, what is that... What, what is that task like? What is finding your lane? Well, you just want to, you know, identify the open colors. Um, in this format, there's going to be generally one or two guilds that you can kind of move into. And I, uh, it's going to be, you know, the signal is just going to be the gold cards. Like, if you're getting premium gold cards, fifth, sixth pick, then, you know, that's your lane. They're like, when I got, I got a third pick, third or fourth pick Simic Ascendancy, and that was like, wow, maybe Simic's open. And then I got a Law Mages Binding the very next pick, and I'm like, okay, that's definitely the open lane. Especially with a card like Simic Ascendancy, which there was a lot of controversy in my house of how good it was. I thought it, I thought it was like a broken rare, and other people thought it was unplayable. So, like, you can, you can like, the Agomain have thought the same thing. It's an, un an unplayable card. So, you know, you have to kind of figure out that puzzle of, you know, what level these great players are on because, you know, even though we're all great players, we still think differently. And of course, uh, something that I think is the, the big difference playing at this level than playing, you know, maybe in, in a store draft is that willingness to abandon some of those early picks. Um, how, how valuable a skill is that in terms of improving your limited game? Oh, it's, it's super valuable. I, I, like, a lot of the times you'll take, like, your first pick and, you know, the, the term is you'll get married to it and then you're just like, all right, I'll take a slightly worse card here, a slightly worse card here. My cards will come. I know they will, but they're not going to come. It just means someone else is taking them. And when you take a slightly worse card, pick three or four, you know, but it's a card that shouldn't be there, that means that these people have taken cards likely in your colors and you just need to accept that your first pick and your second pick aren't going to get played and the rest of them, you know, the, the rest of the pack, you'll hopefully get hooked up. Right. So you, you may be wondering, you know, why, why are we talking to Mike Sigrist? He lost. You know, we don't always talk to the person who lost. What we're doing this weekend is we're going to follow Mike through this draft. Win, lose, or draw. You're, you're prepared. If, if this goes really south, oh. you're prepared to be here, right? Oh, oh this, it won't be the first time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, yeah. But he, he drafted a, real, a really good Azorius stack. We, think, uh, we don't think there were many more biogenic oozes at the table. We'll yeah. find out. Uh, <laughs> Thanks so much, Mike, and good luck the rest of the way here in the draft. Thank you. Appreciate it.